Hello, and welcome to Better Than Art School. In this lecture, I'm going to be talking about design. First, I'm going to define it in the most broadest terms I can, and then I'm going to talk more specifically about two-dimensional visual design. All right, so this is a semi-official definition of design, I would say. Design is the creation of a plan or a convention for the construction of an object, image, product, service, system, or process of human interaction. Okay, and so you can design pretty much anything. You can design a shirt. You can design a meeting. You can design an experience for somebody. You can design, you know, anything. You can. It's just putting together something with agency and intent and doing it in a way where there's, you know, certain aesthetic concerns and it's solving certain problems basically. Okay, so a more succinct definition, and I think the one that we that we really need, is that when you're designing something, and this applies pretty much to all forms of design, but especially to 2D design, you're trying to, to solve real problems in the practical world, but you're also trying to do it in a way that's aesthetically pleasing, either beautiful or interesting, and that is a better definition for our purposes of design. So just remember, you're, it, it has two sides to it. You're trying to do something practical in the real world, something functional, and then you're also trying to make it beautiful in the process. Okay, and you might be shocked. I was certainly shocked when I was a child and I kind of started realizing how much of our world is designed. Like even woods are designed. You know, there's certain like areas that you go that you think, oh, I'm in nature now because I'm in a park. No, that, that park has been thought out and designed by civic engineers or, you know, whoever. And pretty much everything in our world is designed at this point. Even, even in, if you, if you look at really deep history and you look at how hunter-gatherer peoples would cross over an area and murder all the megafauna or eat all the megafauna animals, eat the large animals, and thus changing the ecosystem. That's a form of kind of unconscious design, you might say. So even every everywhere you go in the world, there's a their human fingerprints are all over it. Okay. So these are examples of things that have been designed. This is a banana. This is what an old banana looked like before they were selectively bred. So you might not think of a banana as being something that's designed, but in fact they are. I remember when I was a little kid, I was eating a mandarin orange one time, and I was like, oh, it's so perfect. It comes in these little slices. How perfect that is. And I thought, wow, nature. Uh, and then, you know, I didn't realize at the time that, well, they've been bred to do that. They've been bred to come into little slices. That's not an accident. This is uh, paintings of watermelons uh, from the 1500s and then watermelons today. And you can see that they're much more... Uh, tasty looking today than they were back then with all that rind and stuff. So things have been bred over generations and generations to serve human purposes more, and that's a form of design, a really broad kind of form of design. Okay, so this is called an Ashwellian hand axe, and these are found all over Asia, all over Europe, all over Africa, and they were made about the same way for tens of thousands of years because they served a specific purpose. That purpose might be putting at the end of the spear of a spear to take down a large animal, kind of like I mentioned earlier, or maybe it's to chip wood, or maybe it's to fight another group of people or whatever, and compare that to the iPhone. Okay, so first let's talk about their similarities. Both are designed by humans for humans. Both are designed to fit the human hand. Those are some similarities, but what are some differences? There's lots of differences, obviously. The hand axe can be made by one person. The iPhone needs a vast infrastructure, uh, thousands of people to be able to make it. You can't just make an iPhone by yourself. You can't just sit around one day and go, you know, I'm going to make an iPhone. You can't even really make a pencil by yourself. It takes a lot of people to make just a pencil. So uh, that's those are some of the differences. A hand axe can perform, I don't know, eight different, you know, you can use it for eight different things. Um, an iPhone, what, thousands, you know? So that's that's some differences. But both are designed, and this kind of shows how technology keeps, keeps going faster and faster. The rate of technology keeps going faster and faster. The fact that the Ashwellian hand axe is basically unchanged for generation after generation, where the iPhone is updated every year, um, and 
you know, just from flip phones to iPhones and things keep, you know, innovation keeps building on innovation. That's all a form of design when you think about it. All right. So let's talk more about 2D design. By this, I mean 2D visual design. And let's talk about content and form. That's the most basic distinction you can make for a piece of art or a piece of design. Like in this picture, for instance, the content is a, a realistic picture taken from a photograph of a young man, right? But the form is, well, it's uh, puzzle pieces, right? It's done with a certain color, certain color scheme. It's done in such a, in a certain way, okay? So the content is basically, it's what you're trying to say. This is, these are kind of longer definitions, but the real, the real quick way, the real pithy way to say it is content is what you're trying to say. Form is how you say it. But I'll go ahead and read this because I think this gets into a little bit more. So content is what's communicated. The message the artist intends to get across, it can be found in subject matter. Now subject matter is just what you're depicting, what the picture is of, such as a narrative art that tells a story. So if you think about Renaissance paintings, uh, biblical stories, the, and there the content would be whatever the biblical story is, right? Or Greek mythological stories, whatever. It may be emotional or intellectual or could include the way the media is manipulated if that manipulation is driven by an idea. So if you ever hear that term, like does the form meet the content, that's sort of what that's getting at. Okay, so that brings us to form. What you see, the physical the physical manifestation of art that includes the media, which is the materials you use, uh, the manipulation, arrangement of the visual components, and subject matter as it's treated as components. It's what the work looks like. Okay, so if you decide to do something uh, very realistically, that's a certain kind of form, and on and on. So let, let's, instead of talking about this in a kind of abstract way, let's get a good example of this. Okay, so let's take the story of Icarus. All right, so the, the story of Icarus is a simple one. It's a Greek mythological story. You probably heard it or heard of it before, but basically Daedalus and his son Icarus, they're escaping from a, an island where the Minotaur is. The Minotaur is that fellow with a bull head chasing them out of a maze, and then they fashion together some wings out of feathers and wax, and before they fly away from the island, the father says to the son, he says to Icarus, uh, don't fly you know, too close to the ocean because the waves might take you down. Don't fly too close to the sun because the heat will melt the wax and you'll fall. So basically take, have the middle path. Don't, you know, don't go to extreme, stay in the middle. And that's what the story is about. That's sort of the lesson of the story. So these are both depictions of the same story. And so they both have the same exact content. They're both the story of Icarus but they're very different, have very different forms. And the one on the left, you might say it's more realistic. It tells more of the story in certain ways. The one on the right by Matisse, this one is more iconic. It's made of cut out paper. But let's take the Matisse one uh, in a little more in depth. So the one from Matisse, uh, you can look at it two different ways. You can say, okay, well, this is a silhouette of Icarus falling, his wings have just melted and he's falling to his death. But, Let's take the, the formal elements, in this case color, and talk about what they also mean conceptually. Uh, so how does a blue background function? That's, well, you might say, okay, so it's sky or it's ocean, and either of those could be true. But also you could say it sets a mood for the, for the picture. It's a sad story, right? So it's like the blues, it sets a tone. So how does a black shape function? The, the black shape is obviously Icarus. It's obviously a silhouette of Icarus falling, done in an iconic way and not a super realistic way. It doesn't have fingers. It doesn't have, you know, an ear or something like that. But it's it's kind of a humanoid shape that feels like it's falling. It feels like it's out of control. It also feels heavy. Uh, black is a dense color. It has weight. It feels like it's falling in this in this sense. How does the red shape function? That's like his heart or his aspiration. How does the yellow shape function? You could say, well, maybe this is stars reflected in the ocean or something. I think it's actually just the wings melting, but that's up for argument. But basically, in addition to just as a subject matter concern being the, the wings that are falling, it's also like the action marks in a comic book. Like, you know, when somebody punch, when Batman punches Robin, I don't know why I punch Robin because they're on the same team, but say, Batman punches Robin, and there's like a pow mark. That's kind of, before comic books, this was kind of doing that. It's saying like, it's adding activity to the picture. Okay, there's a pig eating an ice cream cone, and I will see you next time.